In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. Today is the fifth Sunday of the Blessed Month of Bauna, and today we take from a familiar passage. We read about the multitude, uh, feeding the multitudes, the five loaves and two fish. We read it many times in the Coptic Church. We read it the third of a beep. We read it any fifth Coptic um, Sunday, the fifth Sunday of any Coptic month, um, the ninth hour of Agbeya, if we're familiar with Agbeya, and, and among other things. So we should be very familiar with this passage. And the church puts this gospel passage in our minds during the fifth Sunday, because typically we have four Sundays in every Coptic month. And if we have a fifth Sunday, this is an abundance, it's a blessing. Um, so we remember this prayer, or this gospel passage. So, but it's interesting. It's interesting to notice in scripture the times that Christ could do a miracle and he was even asked to do a miracle, but he refused. It's also interesting to notice the times when he was not asked to do a miracle and a miracle is exactly what he did. If you look at the very beginning of his ministry, after his baptism, he was driven out into the wilderness by the Holy Spirit for a time of temptation, fasting. And after 40 days, he's hungry, and it's just after this that he begins his public ministry. And out in the desert, after having fasted for 40 days, Satan tempts him. And in his mocking, in his tempting, He's trying to get Christ to sin and to listen to the words of the devil. And he asks him to perform a miracle. He said, if you are the son of God, then speak and you can change these stones into bread. There is no doubt that Christ could have done that, but he refused. And I think this brings me to my first point. He was not going to perform a miracle just to take care of his own needs. And then... We fast forward a short time later at the wedding of Cana of Galilee. No miracle was asked of him. His mother, St. Mary, sees the needs of the guests at the wedding and the needs of the people at the wedding, and she requests no miracle. She simply intercedes. She goes to Christ and she asks him to take care of things. And in response, he turns the water into wine, and he shows his glory to the disciples. No miracle was requested, but a miracle is exactly what they got. Now, you look out here in the wilderness, in the passage from Luke 9, uh, verses 12 to 17. He's been teaching for days. Thousands of people are following him, this great crowd. And they're far from the cities, and they're out of food. <clears throat> any resources that they brought with them have been used and they're becoming very hungry and no miracles requested. He simply has compassion on their human needs. He knows that they're hungry and in his compassion for them, he multiplies the loaves and the fish into so much food that he feeds thousands and they pick up basketfuls of the fragments afterwards. And then fast forward, I'll come back to this point. And then we fast forward in the Gospel of St. Mark. Uh, we see the Pharisees running to him. And the Pharisees mocking him as they always were. And demanding that he give a sign from heaven. Demanding that he give a sign from heaven. To prove himself, to show who he really is. And he refuses. And he says, a wicked and adulterous generation seeks for a sign and says, no sign from heaven shall be given unto them. Here, he had been out in the wilderness. He had fed thousands of people, this huge crowd, with a few loaves and fish. Sounds like a great sign to me. And then he goes to the Pharisees. When they demand a sign, when they demanded a miracle for him to prove himself, he refuses. And then later, as he's going to his death, he's taken in front of Herod. And remember, Herod's excited, right? Because he had been wanting to meet Christ. Because he had been wanting to see him do a miracle. He wanted to be entertained. And Jesus wouldn't even talk to him. He performed no miracle. And then he was up on the cross, 
and they asked for another miracle. Can you imagine the scene, being dehydrated and being whipped and being bloody and somebody mocking, cries out, asking for a miracle? Well, why don't you come out down from the cross and prove yourself? Show us who you really are. And he refused to perform that miracle. He refused. But he did something more amazing, something that no one asked of him. He got up out of his own grave three days later. So often, the miracles that were demanded of him, he refused. And the miracles which were not requested is exactly what he gave. Again, let's recap. Think of the miracles that he refused. He refused to listen to the words of Satan. He refused to turn the stones into bread to serve himself because he was hungry. He wasn't going to serve himself. And then when the Pharisees came and demanded a sign from heaven, he wasn't going to do something to, uh, extraordinary just to prove himself. And in front of Herod, he's not going to do some miracle just to entertain or to satisfy the curiosity. And then he certainly wasn't going to come down from the cross that he came to die on. And the miracles that he did perform, he performed from a different motive. Not to serve himself, not to prove himself, not to entertain himself, not to satisfy curiosity. He performs miracles. He will literally take the physical laws of nature that he created to bind the universe together, and he will bend and break those laws out of love. To meet human need, underlying need. At the wedding of Cana, he honored his mother. He performed this miracle out of love. Out of love to the married couple, out of love to the wedding guests, out of love for his mom. When he fed the multitude, he wasn't doing it because he was like, you know, I'm out of bread and I'm hungry and I think I'll make some extra for everybody else. No, he wasn't going to do that to serve himself. He spent 40 days, not three days, he spent 40 days with no food and he still wouldn't do a miracle to feed himself. But he did this out of compassion. Out of compassion. It actually says in the recalling of the same miracle in the Gospel of St. Mark in chapter 8, it actually says he had compassion on the multitude because they had been following him. He is the reason why they're out there for those many days. He knows that their hunger is not because of laziness. It's not because of neglect. They're not hungry because of sin. It's because they have been pursuing righteousness. They have been pursuing his words. That's why they were hungry. Remember when responding to Satan... When he was being tempted to make bread, our Lord said, Man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. And this is how the people had been living for the past few days. Following him farther and farther into the wilderness. Giving no thought to whether they had any provisions left. They spent days of their lives hanging on every word that was proceeding out of the mouth of God. And he had compassion on them. He cared for their physical needs. He wanted their hunger to end. He cares about them. He loves them. And so he bent the physical laws of the universe so he could make extra bread and fish so that these dear people could eat. The Pharisees, mocking and demanding a sign to prove himself, he refused. The call for entertainment, he refused. The call to prove himself by coming down from the cross, he refused. But him going to the cross, dying, and then rising again, one of the greatest miracles of all time, the miracle of the incarnation, the miracle of the resurrection, these miracles that were never asked for, these miracles that will never be repeated, that will never be surpassed, he performed out of love, not to serve himself. 
If he wanted to serve himself, he could have stayed and exalted in heaven and not come down and embraced the humility of the Incarnation. His resurrection, he didn't do that to prove himself or to serve himself. It was out of love. If he wanted to do it to prove himself to everybody, he would have appeared to everybody in his resurrected body. Everybody. But the scripture is very clear. He did not appear to Pontius Pilate. He did not appear to Herod or to Caiaphas or any of those people. He appeared to those who already knew him, who already loved him. He appeared to the apostles. Before he appeared to them, he appeared to the women who had served him and had walked with him. At one point, he appears with 500 Christians all at once. But the powers that be, no, he didn't appear to the emperor of Rome. He didn't appear to the Pharisees. God has nothing to prove. He's God. He's God. Now, where am I going with this? We, I, we're all beggars. Every single one of us, we're all beggars. All of us come into this world naked with nothing to give God. We're all sinners. And we all can remember specific things that we have done where we have fallen short from the glory of God. Every single one of us, if we make it to heaven, it won't be because we deserve it. All of us are here, breathing God's air, eating God's food, drinking God's water, because God has mercy on us every single day, and God meets our needs. Needs. He meets our needs. God gives us a home when I don't deserve it. He gives me food when I don't deserve it. He gives me drink when I don't deserve it. Clothes when I don't deserve it. He rose from the dead for us, for me, for salvation, for the forgiveness of our sins. Every single miracle that he performed was not self-serving. It was not to prove himself in some way. It was not to entertain or to satisfy. Every miracle he performed was from a motive of love, a motive of compassion. People who have trouble believing in the existence of God frequently say, you know, I would believe if only God would show himself to me. If the heavens parted and he came to me personally and he revealed himself to me. And that seems logical. But it's convenient. If you are an unbeliever, there are very few ways for God to reach you unless you want to be reached. If a man came back from the grave and told the unbeliever that Hades was a terrible place of torment reserved for those who don't repent, the unbeliever might laugh. He might question whether or not you really were dead. He would question whether or not you were delusional or just crazy. He might even grant you that you really truly believe the things that you saw, but maybe it was subconscious thoughts that were really weren't based in reality. The truth is that there are very few scenarios that will change a man's heart unless he actually wants to be changed. And I think the same is true for each one of us, even if we're born in the church. Sometimes we spend our lives looking for miracles. We look for visitations from angels, visitations from the saints. We look for visitations from the Lord himself. But that's not the way that God typically works in our lives. It's not external circumstances that will bring us a lasting happiness or peace, or joy. It's not the external. It's having our happiness and our peace 
built on a solid foundation that cannot be shaken by anyone or anything. We're forgetful of the gifts that God has already provided for us right here and now. It's convenient. Ultimately, we are, as his children, meant to know and to come to a deep understanding that what we're most thankful for is the Lord himself. That's all I need. That's it. I just need Christ. And we're thankful for his love and his compassion, for his sacrifice in order to give us new life. And we're thankful for his forgiveness of our sins, of my sin. We're thankful that he has conquered death in order to give us resurrection. He is our hope. He is our joy and the greatest blessing in our life. And if we understand this in our hearts, that the Lord is with us and that he will never leave us, it's we who leave him, then there is simply no way to be anything but thankful. Through him, we are rich beyond measure. We are blessed beyond measure. And we will have life without measure. And glory be to God forever. Amen. Blessed.